What's up booktube? It's Leah Cooper and today I'm bringing you my November wrap up. This is a little late and I won't lie I was thinking maybe I should just do a November December wrap up but I read enough stuff in November that I think I, I do need to give it its own wrap up. Based off my stats that I track with my spreadsheet November was my second best month for pages read out of this year. I read nine things and a total of just over 2100 pages so it's a really good mix of things and I do feel proud of myself I guess for picking books that I own physically. I'm going to try to talk about these in the order that I finished them in the month. They're just kind of listed all in different orders on my spreadsheet. The first thing I finished was This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal Motar and Max Gladstone. This is a science fiction novel. I think it's a 2019 release and oh my gosh I loved this. Let me check my spreadsheet. I think I gave it a five star. Oh I guess I gave it a four star but on reflection I would definitely probably bump that up to 4.5. It's one of the best things that I read this year. It's a very weird future. There's two warring factions and both of them have agents manipulating time but it's not like <clears throat> literal hard science fiction. It's very cerebral, weird, almost fantastical science fiction. The story doesn't go into the mechanics of how anything works and stuff is described in very literal but also metaphorical ways. So I know this book is not going to be for everyone but I freaking loved it. It's about two uh, warring time agents who have actually fallen in love with one another and they're leaving one another messages in um, their work and it's so so good. I freaking loved it. <laughs> I was happy to see it get some recognition at the Goodreads Choice Award voting thing but of course it didn't win because it's too good. <laughs> good books don't win that award. Anyway. Okay, moving on. If you like weird stuff, if you don't, if you don't need things scientifically explained to you, check it out. If you like time travel, love stories, I don't know. It was super cool. The next thing I finished was an audiobook and that was Silver on the Tree. This is the last book in the Dark is Rising sequence by Susan Cooper, which is a classic work of kids fantasy fiction. There were so many things about this that felt like the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia series. If you've read The Last Battle, I was actually very disappointed in this one, primarily for the end. The f I, I'm trying to remember the front half of the story. Like I think the front half of the story was fine. It has all of the kids, like the three siblings from the first book. It has Will. It has uh, Bran, Bron, is that how they say his name? The kid from The Great King. And it started out fine and it was cool having all these kids together. And like I, I've mentioned, I think Will and Bron are the best characters in the series. But oh man, um, there's this really irritating betrayal in the book. Um, and of course it's a woman and then okay editing Leah popping in really quickly on my crappy MacBook FaceTime camera I had put this out of my memory um, between the reading the end of Silver on the Tree and recording that wrap-up because there was like a month in between doing those things um, so I don't go into this except briefly here I mentioned that there's a betrayal and of course it's a woman and I kind of eye roll. Um, I'm eye rolling because this by far is the most sexist of the books um, and it it was to the point where it didn't just age badly it was insulting um, especially coming from a female author like that really bugs me. So there is a character in the book who is like he's described as the white writer and he's supposed to be um, the kind of mirror of the dark writer from The Dark is Rising and he is an agent of evil and literally every single time he appears on screen, every single time he speaks on screen, the author makes a really 
big point of talking about how feminine he appears and like how that is an indicator of his like how he's an agent of the dark and how and it's really done over and over and over again I think to evoke disgust in the reader as though having feminine qualities is disgusting or horrible yeah um it was awful the conclusion like the action conclusion of like this whole battle between good and evil is a bit of a letdown and then it does this cardinal sin for me in that it chooses to erase everyone's memory and retcon everyone's memory for convenience sake so it was a real it was honestly a really disappointing and unmemorable conclusion to like an okay series overall big i i should talk about this a bit since this was kind of like my year-long project because i think i read the second book no i started re-listening to all of them at the like beginning of the year i want to say oversee understone i did listen to in january so this is like a year-long project listening to a childhood series revisiting a childhood series that i never finished as a kid and uh, parts of it are good parts of it are meh parts of it are really we went there <laughs> I'm really kind of sad with how not good the ending is and how forgettable it was is like sitting here I've, I've been having to remind myself of of what happened because I've completely forgotten it and yeah it's just it has a really weak ass kind of conclusion to everything that I think is very typical of 20th century early 20th century children's literature where nothing really changes or or everyone has to forget and grow up you don't get to keep the portal fantasy not that this was a portal fantasy but you know in those kinds of books you always go home and you always forget and i think that's really typical of that era of children's literature i don't think it happens quite as much in modern children's literature i think current writers are a lot more interested in dealing with the fact that stuff has ramifications and you don't just wave a wand and everyone forgets and also i i feel like we've moved away from waving a wand and taking away an experience from someone like a positive experience from them too i don't know it bugged me it really bugged me i don't think i would recommend the series to kids um i've got i've got lyriel at the top of a stack of books because obviously none of, I, none of my books are put away they're just in piles everywhere actually i should probably film a clip of this so you understand what i'm talking about just piles everywhere now i have to reframe myself okay focus okay so i've got i've got lyriel staring at me and that's an example of a series i've admittedly only read the first three but they're like a pretty complete trilogy and it's so good it's like so much better by comparison it's also admittedly young adult and from the 90s so it like i'm i'm shocked that it doesn't fall into that horrible trap because the tamora pierce books oh man i really listened to those this year too and i really didn't like them either so my my little ex my little project of listening to more kids older kids fantasy literature has been very hit or miss, miss this year susan gaper was a miss okay moving quickly on because i took too much time talking about that the next thing i finished in november was a physical book and that was Wedge's Gamble. <laughs> and this is the second book in the Rogue Squadron Star Wars Extended Universe books. These are a very old 90s series that I read as a young person and really adored. I read the first one, I reread the first one of these last summer. And then I, I want to continue rereading my Star Wars novels just for fun. Um, I didn't like the first one very much last year, but I put this one on my Space Opera September TBR. Didn't get to it in September, but I still wanted to read it and make progress on that reread project. So I read it last month and I quite enjoyed it. I think I gave it three and a half stars. It was just, it was a great thing to read on my break at work and I enjoyed it. It's not great literature. It's not ground earth shattering. However, I will say Stackpole's writing is better in this one. Like his writing was real fucking annoying and really grating. He has a couple authorial tics, like the way he tries to create 
<clears throat> character the way he tries to like make the reader feel invested in the characters works on a 10 year old does not work on a 30 year old <laughs> But he did a lot less of that in this book and I appreciated that. I will say that this kind of kicked off a month of sci-fi reading. Well this and like How to Lose the Time War is another example. I was, I am just, I still feel it actually. I'm just like super in the mood for science fiction. I've also been re-watching all of Star Trek Voyager. It is so good and I love it. <laughs> like um, my boyfriend I think my boyfriend and I also were re-watching some of the Star Trek movies. Like man I've just been on a real sci-fi kick so this this was very satisfying to that. And for class I also read a book called The Real Problem Solvers. I've already sold my copy back to the school library so I don't have it anymore but I'll insert a picture. I uh, this was written by Ruth Shapiro I think and I was taking a uh, like small business slash how to create social entrepreneurships class and I fucking hated it. This book is just um, kind of like individual little TED talks from a bunch of people who are like social entrepreneurs or like social funders. Eh, it, I think I gave it like a 2 or 2.5 because they're written by different people um the quality of the individual chapters varies wildly some of them don't write super well just like they're all over the place thematically like what they're point trying to get their point across some of them are fine and interesting i would say one of the stories out of all of them has really stuck with me quite a few of them i just kind of found annoying because it was like how to do really good social entrepreneurship or how to make a lot of uh progress or like how to have social impact is uh know someone who will give you money like that's how a lot of it seemed to boil down to because it all takes money so you have to be good at like schmoozing money out of people who have money or you can found ebay <laughs> like it was just it was just obnoxious so yeah not for me but hey, I actually read a book for nonfiction November. The next thing I read was another audiobook, and it was an audiobook novella. It was The Jewel in Her Laboratory by Fran Wilde. Earlier this year, I did read a short story by Fran Wilde, and I loved it. It was one of the best things in the collection that I was reading. I wanted to read more from her, and this was available as an audiobook for my library, so I went ahead and checked it out. Fortunately, I didn't really like this. I, I don't know if it was the writing, or if there was a problem with some of the editing, there was like, <sighs> the narrator would say a line and then repeat the line. And it, but they were like nonsense lines. Like it wasn't like repeated for emphasis. It wasn't like, oh, that's the title of a chapter and, and the titles of the chapter happen to be the first line in the chapter. I thought that for a while, but it doesn't work. Or, oh, maybe those are point of view swaps, but it doesn't always correspond to the point of view swap. So I don't know if that was a writing choice that was just weird or maybe it was like just a really egregious editing error because it, it continued through the entire audiobook. But I had a big problem with that. But besides that, because that's just like that sounds like a technical thing, right? I just I didn't like the pacing. The choices the characters were making were kind of a little all over the place. There was some like backtracking that happened that I didn't really like. It's about it's about this kingdom that fell and it's uh, the royal family has enslaved this class of people who can hear these gems of power and so they socket the gems of power and they bind the people who can hear them to keep them from like going insane and following the orders of the gems and then they use the gems to protect and rule their kingdom and the head of the lapidaries those are the people who can hear the jewels uh slaughters the entire royal family except for this one princess whose lapidary is his daughter and he's gonna sell out the kingdom to another a warlord but then he kills himself because he goes in, he goes insane and then the warlord arrives and grabs the princess and her lapidary and is wants to marry the princess to the prince and it's just it's so weird and I really hate the choices the author made for where the story went because I really feel like the, the whole theme of it was 
yay, imperialism and slavery is okay. Because that's kind of how it ended. Like the princess ends up telling her lapidary she has to sacrifice herself so that the princess can live. And then the princess escapes by pretending to be the lapidary and the lapidary dies. And it's like, ew, gross. So really didn't like it. I know there's a sequel. I'm not going to read it. I, I hope it's just a miss from Fran Wilde. And I hope the next thing I try from her, because I am going to try another long work from her, I hope I'll like it more. I'm going to skip ahead slightly. I'm going to talk about my one DNF last month. Uh, I wanted something quick and easy to read and sort of Christmassy, like because it was end of the month. So I did try to read A Marquess for Christmas by Vivian Westlake. This is just like a silly little historical Christmas romance novel that I got free off some Amazon deal years ago and it's just been like sitting in my Kindle. Um, I tried to read it, <laughs> couldn't do it, didn't like it. I DNF'd it maybe like a quarter of the way in. How many pages did I get through? Oh I got through 25 pages. It's not very long though. I think it's only like 200 like 150 to 200 pages so it's it's not very long. I'm maybe I got like 10% in and I just I'm I can't read romance at the moment. I'm really not liking romance. This wasn't particularly well written. Wouldn't recommend it to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Moving on to my unpopular opinion. <laughs> so the next thing I read fell in Tome Topple. Originally I was thinking I wouldn't be able to participate in Tome Topple because of school but I went ahead and decided I uh, school's not for me. Um, like I just I'm just I tried to go back it didn't work. Uh, I hated my classes they were giving me depression so you know about midway through November I was done and since I was just done <laughs> I decided to read a 500 page tome for Tome Topple and I picked up the Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. So I've owned this for a little while. I think it was on my Tome Topple potential TBR last round or two rounds ago, but I never got around to it. Everyone loves this book. Everyone has read this book on booktube. I thought I was gonna love this. This might even be in a five star predictions video. I don't know because I can't remember what's on my five star predictions TBR, but uh, I think I gave it two stars. The one thing I will say is it's very readable. It's a uh, real fast read. Like I just read this in a couple of days and I didn't even like it. I hate Marcus. Marcus is a dick. And people who think this is some great epic swooping romance, it's love at first sight. And the male love interest spends 20, 30 years leading on another woman who then is like, oh, it was all my fault for thinking you cared about me even though you spent that year fucking me and keeping me in your house and then sending me out as an agent to spy on your opponent but okay um I did not like him I don't like the ending like I don't like the ending of the main plot line I know there's like an epilogue that's like many years in the future didn't like that either <laughs> I don't it's it's I've like put the book out of my memory because it was so such a non memorable book. I don't even have really deep thoughts about it. But it was just so it had a lot of potential. It has some atmosphere. Oh, the pacing. The pacing is so much like Becky Chambers. I was I was halfway through it. Not quite irritated with it yet. But I was thinking I, I wrecked it to a, co a co worker. I was like, Have you read this? Because he likes Becky Chambers. And he's like, No, I haven't read it. I was like, Why not? It's totally like Becky Chambers, <laughs> who I can't stand either. Um, it's just there are some bones of some interesting things in this. But fundamentally, I find the circus aspect actually kind of problematic. And I hate the plot. Oh, that's the thing. That's the thing that really bugged me is like this whole book is predicated on a reveal. It's predicated on a mystery. And the reveal is so so much of a non reveal. And it's so not clever. And it's also so cliche that I was like, I felt very let down by this book because when your whole book is predicated, the whole book is built on a reveal, you have to make that reveal real fucking clever. Otherwise, it's just like, really? That's that's why I read 500 pages for Romeo and Juliet. 
sorry, not sorry. I'm sure I'm going to lose like half my subscribers now because I don't like the Night Circus. <laughs> Add it to the list of things that are popular that everyone else loves that I'm like, but why? <laughs> so to follow that up, I did start reading uh, Dreams Underfoot. Oh, my copy's over there. My copy is like on the other side of the room, so I'm not going to grab it. I did start reading Dreams Underfoot by Charles Delent because I wanted to read other fantasy fiction that wasn't going to annoy me. I'm still in the process of buddy reading that with Kelsey and Roya. So that'll be in my December wrap up. And then the last thing I read in November. Oh, wait, no, there's two more things I read in November. Gosh, second to last thing I read, finished reading in November was another audiobook. It was Penrick's Demon by Lois McMaster Bejeweled. This is in the Realm of the Five Gods series, which I think like The Curse of Chalion is in that series, but this takes place way before that book. I haven't really read a lot of Lewis McMaster Bejeweled, so I've been wanting to listen to this for a while because I figured it would be kind of like the type of thing I liked. And I did. I think I gave it like three and a half or four stars. It was really interesting. Um, oh, it's Pen Penrick and Desdemona, their story. And I, it was way different than what I was expecting. It is about a young man who's like the younger son of a minor backwaters nobility. And he's like headed towards his wedding. He's on the road to his wedding. And he encounters this holy woman dying on the side of the road. And uh, she passes because in her this universe, wizards um, gain their magic by having like a demon inside them, like a demon from the realm of the gods. The gods remind me very much of the realm of the five slash six gods from Guild Wars 2. Another reason I was kind of like charmed by this book because I was listening to it while playing Guild Wars 2 a lot. And um, she passes her demon onto him before she dies. And the demons are kind of a composite personality from like the demon itself, but all their previous hosts. And yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite entertaining. Not deep or complex, but just for like, a little fantasy story. I thought it was pretty fun. I've already got the second one out from the library. It's gonna be my next audiobook I listened to this month. So I was, I was quite charmed by it and by like the relationship between Penn and his demon. And then the last thing I read in November was a smash hit. I think I gave it four and a half stars. And that was Planetfall by Emma Newman. Continuing my like sci-fi craze. I, I had a copy of this so I went ahead and picked it up because I have the second one in physical form and the third one as an arc that I never got around to reading. Um, of the three this is one that I didn't expect to like. They're, they're all, the, all three of the books are set in the same universe but they're not necessarily direct sequels to one another. They're more like companion novels in the same universe. So this one follows, this one takes place on a colony on a far distant planet something like 20 years after Planetfall and someone arrives in the colony and he is the descendant of people who they thought had died on Planetfall but in fact they had been wandering as nomads. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. There's a lot of mystery shrouding Planetfall and like what happened and why some people died. Why the Pathfinder, who was like the spiritual center of this expedition, they were going to this planet following her after she'd had visions that this planet would lead them to God. And so there's like this cult. Um, but she has disappeared. She's gone into God City at Planetfall, disappeared and they they have like, they receive message, messages from her once a year, but there's like a lot of mystery surrounding that and surrounding Planetfall, like I said. We follow Renata, who was in love with the Pathfinder and is like kind of the head engineer for the colony. And she has some serious issues <laughs> that come out over the course of this book while we discover what happened and what the secrets were. And this is so good. The writing is so good. Renata's character is heartbreaking. Um, she has, I guess I'd call it a mental illness. I think it is technically considered a mental illness. I don't, I, I'm like debating whether or not to reveal this. Quick spoiler, 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 spoiler. When I put my hand down there, I'll be done. She's a hoarder, which is not something I see in books very often. 
and it's done really well in this book. Spoiler done. Okay. So like I was really impressed with that. And then also I love the technology in this. So it's obviously like far future space. Well, they have become spacefaring. They're living on an alternate planet and everything. Instead of like replicators, they use printer 3D printer technology. And it's just so cool because it's like we could get there. Like we could get to that technology, but it still feels like really unique, cool and like sci-fi and like futuristic. So I just I I loved this book so much. Um, probably the second best thing I've read this year. It'll probably be on my like top 10 books that I read this year. Um, I can't wait to read the sequel. And yeah, um, cannot, cannot recommend this enough. I think I feel like this came out at the same time as like N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth and Nine Fox Gambit and Ancillary Justice. It kind of came out around the same time. And I feel like it got a little overshadowed by those book those books because I don't see people talk about these as much on booktube so yeah that's that's a shame and I'm here to say try Planetfall if you're looking for something sci-fi to read I think it's really good um that's everything I read in November my camera battery is dying and this video has definitely gone on long enough let me know if you've read any of these down below I'm sure some people are going to tell me I'm completely wrong about the night circus and then unsubscribe or dislike this video or whatever, but I'm used to it. <laughs> my most popular video is still my rant about how much I hate American gods. <laughs> so used to it. Um, but yeah, let me know if you're thinking about picking any of these books up or you want to know anything more about any of them. Let me know how your end of the month reading is going. Hopefully it's going well. Mine's actually pretty good I'm like more or less on schedule for my December boyfriend picks my TBR reading project and I'm actually vlogging it fairly consistently go me <laughs> thanks for watching who knows what my next video will be I'm probably going to do all of my like top and bottom I'm gonna do a like top 10 bottom 10 books or maybe like top 10 bottom five something like that some combination of that but I won't be posting those until January just to be just to be safe because I am going to be reading right up until the end of the year and I do like to give my December books a fair shot at being on either of those <laughs> lists <laughs> um but yeah November was a great month and I'm I feel like I'm like really in in a in the thick of like reading good stuff so yeah uh see ya bye mm -hmm.